Well, what's up, Liberty? Great to be with you. I hope you're doing well. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. And I know that uh, this is the final push, right? The final window to the end of the year. Thought I would come and talk to you about marriage. Just kidding. I'm just kidding, okay? Everybody take a deep breath. Just relax. <laughs> uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in uh, Amarillo, Texas. And... Um, I'm surprised people even know there is an Amarillo, Texas, but uh, Amarillo, Texas. I uh, had parents that went to church and they would go to church. They would uh, uh, sort of drop me off and I would tell them I was going to the youth group, to the junior high or the high school group, and they were going to go to the main service. And um, I would walk through the church, walk out into the alleys around the church, smoke cigarettes, watch the people walk in and walk out, wait till it was over, and then I would meet my parents back up at the car. And they say, well, Judd, how was church? I said, it was great. I said, what'd you learn? I said, I learned about Jesus. My mom would say, what did you learn about Jesus? I'd say, well, I learned that Jesus loves me. It's always the safe answer, right? And, which is funny now because I have an eight-year-old and recently he came back from church and uh, he got home. I said, Ethan, how was church? He says, it was great. I said, what'd you learn about church? I said, I learned about Jesus. I said, get over here and sit down. That is not going to work in this house. We're going to talk about this, you know. But I didn't really get church. I didn't really get Christianity. I didn't understand what the point was as a teenager. And so I spent a lot of weekends standing in that parking lot, watching people walk in and walk out. Started running around with a bunch of kids that were older than me, uh, got caught up in the drug scene, first just at parties, but pretty soon on uh, heavier and heavier stuff. And in my teenage years, went through about four years of really solid drug abuse and drug addiction. And I came to a crossroads. Uh, it was just that place that you come to where you realize something's got to change. In my case, I had overdosed, been unconscious. And when I came to, I realized that I was either going to die or I was going to get help. I was going to go crazy or, or I was going to end up in jail. It was one of those uh, uh, options that were before me. And at 17 years old, for the first time in my life, I walked through the doors of that church on my own terms asking my own questions, seeking God and needing help. And this little group of people met in this small group Bible study and really became a refuge for me. Now, these weren't the cool kids. These weren't the people that had it all together. We were a bunch of oddballs, you know? But I look back on those people and God used those people to save my life. God used those people to coach me off the edge when I wanted to quit. He used them to hold me accountable. He used them to help me deal with the destructive stuff that was in my life, and there was plenty of it. And friends, I look back, that was over 23 years ago now, and what I realize is pretty much everything good that's happened in my life goes back to two things, my relationship with Jesus and that group of people who surrounded me in life and helped me face the destructive tendencies that I was wrestling with. They helped me deal with the temptation in my life. And so I want to talk to you today about how we can deal with temptation in our own lives. Now, I know I've come from Sin City, and we're known for sin. We're known for temptation, and particularly sin that's kind of in your face. You know, theologians, they tended to categorize sin into a couple different categories. There was one category, which would be the sins of the Spirit. And uh, those are the, the, the things that maybe aren't as obvious, you know, things like uh, lack of compassion towards other people or pride or prejudice or condemnation. Uh, and then there was the obvious stuff that they would call sins of the flesh, things like lust and sexuality and gambling and alcoholism. And, you know, those are the things that Las Vegas is known for. In fact, I was riding along with, I've got an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. We're in a minivan. We pulled up to a stop sign recently and my, my eight-year-old boy looks up at this billboard and it's a billboard of, of uh, women with their backs to you and it looks like they're naked the way the billboard's structured. And my son says as innocently as he can to his sister, he just says, Emma, which naked girl is your favorite? I like the one with brown hair. <laughs> Listen, these are the moments when you wonder like, God, did you really call me to Las Vegas? I mean, am I really supposed to do this? So my wife, in a moment of parenting brilliance, turns around and says to my son, she says, we do not have favorite naked girls. <laughs> and I thought that's true, but we do have naked girls, right? Here they are. So Las Vegas is sort of known for sins of the flesh. 
But what's interesting as you look at the teaching of Jesus is there is another category of sins, the sins of the Spirit, that may actually be more dangerous. It may actually be more destructive in our lives because Jesus was often more upset, apparently, about sins of the Spirit than even sins of the flesh. When the religious lacked compassion for those who were hurting and for those who were broken, when people began to embrace this idea of self-righteousness and, hey, I don't need anything, I've got it all together, when people began to look down the religious leaders on other people in judgment and in a haughty attitude, that stuff was offensive to Jesus. And so I don't know what you're wrestling with today. Maybe you're just tired and you're wrestling with the fact that this is the final push and your temptation today is to just sort of check out. I mean, your temptation is to just coast through the rest of maybe this semester or maybe for some of you, you're thinking, I'm coasting the rest of this year, man. Maybe for some of you, you're headed towards graduation and all you can think about is getting out and getting into your career and you just want to check out from the rest of this process. Maybe for some of you, you're wrestling with temptations that you brought with you into liberty, that you brought with you to the school. You thought, man, if I go to a great Christian school with a great Christian education, I'm going to be able to let go of this stuff. I'm going to move past it. And unfortunately, what you find is, you know, wherever you go, there you are. And so the temptation follows you and it's still there and you're still wrestling with it. I mean, I see this in Las Vegas all the time. People move to Vegas, they load up the U-Haul, they leave wherever they're from, they move to Vegas because they're going to start over. The problem with a U-Haul is you haul it. And so they show up, same problems, same stuff, same situations, just takes a while to reemerge. And I imagine for some of you, you're having that experience even at a great place like Liberty University. So let's talk about how to deal with that because here's what I want you to understand. Um, man, if you don't learn to face the temptations and the destructive tendencies in your life, doesn't matter how smart you are, how gifted you are, where you graduate from, how good your grades are, in a, mo in a matter of moments, it can all get washed away. And we see it every day in the headlines. Politicians, leaders, individuals in business and uh, in the church uh, sector of society making fatal, fatal moral mistakes because they gave in in a moment of weakness to temptation. So if you have your Bibles, want to follow along, I'm going to be in James chapter 1. James gives some great insight to how we can deal with temptation. And I think he's going to bring some encouragement to you for for the last leg of this semester. James chapter one, we're gonna pick it up in uh, verse 12. James chapter one, verse 12 says this, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Now, I want you to notice a couple things. One, it says God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. I don't know about you, but does endure sound like a very fun word? I mean, you know, marathon runners have to endure things, right? Uh, people who, who lift weights and train, they have to endure. Endurance doesn't sound like a lot of fun, but the Bible says when it comes to temptation in our life, part of the process is enduring. Part of the process for you right now, finishing out this semester, finishing out your final year, moving into another phase in your life, part of the process for you is enduring the season that you're in, pushing through it. So how do we do that? Well, James is going to give us a few, a few insights. One is he's going to challenge us to resist the tendency to rationalize in our life. Resist the tendency that we all have to rationalize. I was at Caesar's Palace um, a while back walking with a friend of mine in Las Vegas, and uh, he did something I've never seen anybody do before or since. He's mid-sentence talking to me, and, and in the middle of a sentence, he just throws up. I mean, he's like, yeah, so anyway, blah, like out of nowhere, no warning. I mean, don't you, like when you get sick, don't you kind of go, you know, I'm feeling a little sick. I think I might throw up. I mean, no, excuse me, I need to go to the restroom here, you know, no. I mean, it was just like mid-sentence. Now, how many of you are sympathetic vomiters? You're like, I don't know what that is. A sympathetic vomiter sees somebody throw up, and then you start to throw up. Okay, let me ask that again. Any of you sympathetic? Okay, a few of you. Wow, you guys got, you're strong in here, man. I'm a sympathetic vomiter. So if I see somebody throw up, I immediately get sick. 
This is just what you needed before lunch, right? I immediately start to get sick. And so here I'm walking along with my friend. Out of nowhere, he throws up. And I can't believe, you know, and we just keep walking because, like, what do you do with that, you know? So we're just like three or four steps moving down the, the way. And, and I'm like, are, are you okay? He goes, I, I feel better. <laughs> like, well, I guess you do. And, and it, you know, so... I said, well, I know there's a restroom back this other way. So we turn around and we're going back the other direction now. And we're kind of in the flow of people and nobody really knows this has happened. There's a lot of people around. I'm just trying to get him to the restroom because he goes, I think I'm going to throw up again. And I'm like, oh man. And, and I look over to my left and I see kind of what he had done, but I immediately look away because I know that I get queasy really fast. And all of a sudden this woman walks right into that mess and both feet up, she goes right down on her backside. It was wrong. I mean, it was wrong at every level of wrongness, you know. And it was like there was nothing I could do. It just happened so fast. I was, ah, boom. Now, at this point, I'm moving in the other direction towards this woman now who's on her backside. And what I remember is as we got a little closer, she held her hands up like this and she said, what's this? <laughs> so, well, that's Mexican food, but you don't really want to know what that is, you know. At this point, my friend's about to throw up again, and I look up and her two friends come over and they help her stand up in the midst of this mess. And I just, I didn't stop to help them because he was, you know, about to go again. And I grabbed him and got him around the corner and he threw up like three more times before I got him to the restroom. It was insane. But I think about that scene. That is a lot like life. You're walking along, you're just doing the journey of life. You don't plan on it. And all of a sudden both feet up and you're right down in the middle of a mess. It could be your mess or it could be somebody else's mess, right? It could be a mess you created by your own actions, your own decisions. It could be a mess your roommate created. It could be a mess that person on the dorm floor created. It could be a mess, you know, somebody on your team created, somebody in your class created, and now you're in the middle of it. What do you do with that? What do you do when you're in a mess? Well, the first thing that you have to face is a tendency to rationalize and minimize the fact that you're in a mess. You got to be honest about where you're at. You know, if you're tired right now and, and you just want to quit, you got to be honest about that. If you're ready to, uh, to give go back into some old patterns of behavior. Some of you, you just been home for Thanksgiving. You just got a front row seat again to maybe a life that you left or a past that you left that you're trying to get away from. Some of you have great family situations you go home to. Some of you go home to family situations and not so much, lots of drama. And so you come back, you're aware of all of that. You got to face that tendency to rationalize and be honest. Here's what Paul says in, or what, uh, uh, James says in James chapter 1, verse 14, he says, temptation comes from our own desires. So it's not the devil made me do it. It's not my, my roommate made me do it. You know, it's not if my football team would have won, I would have acted differently. It's not if I'd have made a better grade, then I'd do it different. He says, this is about our own desires. And what do they do? He says, they entice us and they drag us away. So those are two terms. One word is a, is a hunting term, dragged away. It has the idea of, of luring an animal into a bait. And the other word, enticed, is a fishing term where you take bait, you put it on a hook, you drop it down into the water and little Nemo goes along and sees lunch and grabs it and there he goes. And this is how temptation works in our lives. We're just doing the journey of life. Everything looks great. Something looks enticing. It looks good. We get drawn to something and so we go for for it. And what's the result of temptation? Look at this. It says, these desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, check it out, it gives birth to death. Sin always leads to death. Always. Not only separation from God, but emotional, spiritual, even physical impact that comes from sin. I'm in Vegas. I get a front row seat to this every single day. And what's interesting in Las Vegas, I don't really have to talk a lot about how sin leads to death. Because in Las Vegas, by the time people actually show up to church, they're coming because they realize, wow, all that stuff, all the lie, all the hedonism, all the, hey man, you can have as much fun and you can max your senses out and you can go pleasure to the hilt. All of that stuff ultimately ends in a lie and you're alone and you're broken and nobody around you cares and that's where you find yourself. That's when they go, maybe I ought to like go to church or something. 
So they show up at church. And when they walk in, they already know sin leads to death. But the good news is the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have to resist the tendency to rationalize. What, are you, what is your tendency right now to rationalize? What are you tempted with right now that you're, that you're struggling? Maybe some of you, it's a sexual temptation. Maybe you're, you're tempted with lust. Maybe you're tempted in a relationship with somebody else and you just keep wanting to minimize it and rationalize it. Maybe for some of you, you know, you're, you're, you're just tempted because you're tired and you're worn out and that fatigue is very real. Maybe it's more of a sins of the spirit. It's the sense of pride and superiority and maybe you're just really thankful that you're not tempted like all those other heathens on your dorm floor. Maybe you're just really grateful that you're not like all those other people, you know, that you don't wrestle with the things those other people wrestle with. And, and it actually could be that you're in a more dangerous place if that's where you're at than those other people. <laughs> what are you wrestling with from a temptation standpoint? Don't rationalize it. Another thing James is going to challenge us with is simply this, to surrender my powerless will to God again. The way you deal with temptation isn't by trying harder, isn't by giving it more effort and more work. Some of you are already thinking like, yeah, man, I'm going to, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to work harder at, at dealing with that. I believe the way you deal with temptation is to surrender again and again and again your will to God and ask for his strength. And it's only through the power of God's spirit that we can get victory in our lives. And some of us right now, you're tired, you're worn out. You need the power of God's spirit as you push through these final weeks. Some of you need the power of God's spirit to keep studying, to finish the papers you need to finish, to get ready for tests that are coming. You need the power of God's spirit to be able to deal with the situation that you're up against. Because no matter what you're up against, God is not going to allow you to face more than he will empower you to get through. He's not going to allow you to face more than he will empower you to get through. I remember uh, years ago when I was in the best shape of my life, I had this guy that I worked out with. And uh, when, I, when I first met him, it was like this YMCA that was old and nasty and downtown and you sort of went down in the basement and it was dimly lit and there was never anybody there. It was kind of small and, and there was this one dude who was always there. He was huge. I mean, huge, you know, like he, he looked like he just shot up steroids all day every day or something, you know, and, and he, he would lift these weights. This guy was a professional bodybuilder and it was unbelievable the amount of weight that he would lift. And, you know, here I am with my little 20 pound thing, you know, and I would sort of go over to the corner, relegated to the corner, you know, and leave him the space to sort of grunt and do his stuff. And, you know, at one point he looks over at me, he goes, hey man, I'm, I act like I didn't hear him, you know, I say, hey, will you, uh, will you spot me? Now, what do you say? I mean, it was only he and I, and, you know, there's no one else around. I'm like, okay, yeah. So when you spot somebody and you're lifting weights, basically what you're going to do is you're going to sort of stand over them. You're going to try to guide the bar in such a way that you give it some support so that if they get in a difficult situation while they're trying to do a bench press or whatever, you're going to help the bar up so that the bar doesn't collapse down onto their chest. He goes, okay, yeah, I'll, you know, spot me. Okay, I'll spot you. I go over and he puts more weight on this bar than I've ever seen in my life. It's an amazing amount of weight. He just, you know, uh, uh, weight after weight after weight. And he's not going for reps. He's just seeing how much he can do. So he takes it off the bar. He goes down. He goes up. You know, oh, it's awesome. You know, he goes down again. He gets about halfway up. He looks up at me. I'm standing over him. He, he's sort of doing the bench press, right? And he looks up and he goes, a little help. <laughs> do I look that big to you? I, I, I grabbed this bar and I pulled on it as hard as I could. I mean, ugh, no movement, none. <laughs> and he looks at me, his face is red now, and he's like, Whoa. I'm like, I pulled it again. And I had to look at this guy with the bar halfway between, you know, the top and his chest. And, and I told him, that's all I've got. <laughs> what else do you say, you know? I'm sorry. You're going to die now? I'll get you a drink of water for recovery. So he's about halfway down and there's nothing I can do. So he does this, this move. I've never seen anybody do this before, but apparently professional weightlifters, they know what to do if they're really in trouble. And this was a serious amount of weight. It could have really hurt him. 
So what he did is he slid, I mean, this happens so fast, but he slid over to one side, drops the bar completely with his right hand while holding it where it is as much as he can with his left hand and lets the bar hit the edge of the bench. And as soon as it does, all the weights slide off. And when all the weights slide off, the bar flies up the other direction because now there's no weights that, you know, on that side of it. And all the weights slide off this direction. So it's just like, bam, bam. And then he stands up and he throws the bar across the room. Then he turns around and looks at me. And I am literally thinking, I am dead. <laughs> this is it. It went down in a dirty old YMCA <laughs> with fluorescent lights. And he just sort of looked at me for a minute and walked it off and came back around. And after that, we became friends, oddly enough. And, um, <laughs> The next time we were there, he said, let me show you how to lift weights. Let me, let, me, let me show you how to do this. So he started working out with me. He would do his thing. He didn't ask me to spot him anymore, but, you know, <laughs> I'd do my thing. And we got to a place. Then he found out I was a Christian. This guy wasn't a Christian. And when he found out I was a Christian, man, he loved that. So he would get me in these situations where I'd be like lifting weights and I'd be maxed out. I'd have nothing left. I'd go as far as I would think I would go. And he would look at me and he would say, hey, man, if you really love Jesus, if you're a real Christian, you'll give me two more. <laughs> now, I felt like, dude, I got a witness on the line here, right? You know, this isn't just about lifting weights. This guy, because he thinks this whole Christian thing's ridiculous. So I'm like, all right, all right, you know. And so I'd reach deep, you know, try to get two more out. Then he, he started like throwing numbers out at me. He's like, you know, I read that like seven is the perfect number in the Bible. And so I want you to give me seven more. And I look at him like, dude, seven more. I mean, Two more is one thing, seven more is something else. And so he would push me beyond any limit that I'd ever been pushed. And after working out, man, I just remember like, I couldn't even lift my hands. Have you ever worked out so hard that your arms don't work anymore? You know, like you go to brush your teeth and you're like, hey. I, I can literally remember uh, asking my wife, Lori, I was like, could, could, you, uh, could, you know, could you help me brush my teeth? lift the toothbrush up, brush the teeth. I remember trying to get in my car after one of these workouts. That's fun, isn't it? You know, like you get the key out, but you're like, can't get it in the keyhole. You know, you're just trying to get it going. He knew what I could bear and he pushed me right up to the max. And sometimes that's exactly what God does. Let me just read this passage to you. First Corinthians 10, uh, verse 13. It says, God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted more than you can stand. So God will allow us to face these temptations, these trials. Some of us will endure them. And sometimes it will push us beyond the ability that we think we have to get through it. But God isn't going to let anything come into our life that he's not going to empower us to push through. He might push us beyond everything that we thought we could handle. But there's a reason for that. Because what's God doing? He's using the trials and the temptations and the difficulties that we're facing in life. And he's shaping us. He's molding us. He's crafting us into his image. He's making us more like Jesus. And the only way to get that in your life is to face some really difficult stuff and to come through it in the power of his spirit. So surrender my powerless will to God again. Here's what James says, James 1.13. He says, remember, when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. Some of you, when you're tempted, you ever have this experience, you're going through temptation and you look around and you're like, God, you set me up. Like, you allowed this to happen, you knew this was going to happen, it's like, uh, do you, you know, it's like the donut shop. I don't know uh, if you guys have like Krispy Kreme donuts here uh, close by, yeah. It's like, you know, you know you shouldn't be eating a Krispy Kreme donut because you had three Krispy Kreme donuts already and uh, you drive by the Krispy Kreme place and the little hot now sign comes on, right? Now when the hot now sign comes on, what does that mean? That means it's on now, right now. And so you start to say things to yourself like, you know, if it's God's will that I have a Krispy Kreme donut, there will be a parking space right off the front door of the Krispy Kreme when I drive by. And so on the fourth time that you drive by, that parking space opens up. You know it was God's will. You pull right in and there you go. Sometimes when we're tempted, man, we rationalize we, and then we say, well, God, you opened up that parking space. And James is saying, when you're tempted, listen, God has nothing to do with tempting you to sin. 
God may allow trials to come into our life. He may allow things to happen into our life that challenge us, but God isn't tempted to do wrong, he says, and he never tempts anyone else. He says, so don't be misled. Whatever's good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father. He created all the lights in the heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. So God is not only not tempting us, he wants to empower us to experience him and his love and his goodness in our lives. So you got to surrender your powerless will to God again. Because you don't beat temptation by trying harder, but through surrender. I had a friend, he used to see me around the church building, and every time he saw me, he did this little hand move, just like this. I would see him from like across the auditorium, and he would say, hey, John, and I would look over at him, and he'd go. And then he would, he would walk off. Now, I pastor a city full of weirdos, okay? Um, I love them, but there's plenty of weird people in Las Vegas. But even this got weird to me after a while because after about, you know, six weeks of this, every time I see him, hey, Jeff, I'm starting to think like, what's wrong with this guy? You know, like what is going on? And finally one day he came up to me, he says, Judd, he says, do you know why every time I see you, I do this? I'm like, no, but it's really weird. Could you please enlighten me? And he said, I just want you to be reminded every time you see me to take whatever it is you're holding on to and surrender it to God. So he goes, every time you see me, I'm going to do the same thing. And I thought, that's really, that's really good, you know. So I went home that afternoon and I'm standing in the kitchen and my wife's standing there and she's complaining about something. And I said, hey, Lori, No, I didn't do that. But I thought about doing that. Don't try this at home. Don't try it with your roommate. Don't try it on your dorm floor. But, you know, in your own personal life, it's, it's a great reminder to take whatever it is that you're holding on to and just give it to God. Just give it to Him. So I don't know what it is for you. I don't know what you're wrestling with. I don't know what you're being tempted by. I don't know what you're hanging on to, but you're entering into the last lap here, the final push of the semester. Be faithful. Remember God is faithful. Don't rationalize if you're tired and worn out, if you're being tempted, if you're caving, be honest with God about what it is that you're up against. Realize it's not about trying harder, but it's about surrendering your will to God and acknowledging you can't do it on your own. And the great news is you don't have to. Listen. Give it to him, surrender it to him, turn it over to him, and he'll turn your life inside out as you do, and he'll use you in a powerful way. Let's bow and pray together. God, we're grateful for your love for us. I'm so thankful for this great university, for these amazing students and faculty and staff, and I just pray your blessing in their lives. I pray that you'll fill them with your spirit in every way, that you'll encourage them to know that you're with them in the midst of difficulties, trials, temptations, and that, God, you will carry them through the rest of this semester. So we're so grateful for your love for us. We're grateful for the friendships you allow us to to have. We're grateful for the the opportunities that, that Liberty gives to so many students and we just pray you'll open up more and more doors in their hearts and in their lives. We commit our lives to you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you guys.